Ah, let's see. What's today? Anybody know? Today's the 20th. Okay, this is going to be on YouTube, right? Okay, so any of you who want to look me up on YouTube, you may. My birthday is in two days. I do accept checks, but cash is preferable. Preference. <laughs> now, you're going to edit that part out. Thank you very much. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to Suncoast Bible Fellowship. It's good to be here this morning and uh, to be able to open God's Word and spend some time in it. I wrote on the board, I guess if I was to put a topic to our discussion today, the living Word of God, I'm sorry, the living Word of the living God living in you. Um, I don't know, you know, you how much experience you have with people talking about God's Word, but most people really don't want to talk about God's Word. They want to talk about their concepts and their philosophies and their strategies and their ideas of how to deal and cope with life, and they really don't know how to cope with life, primarily because they don't know how to cope with death. And uh, I, I taught, a, I don't remember how long ago it was, last time I got up here and taught was on... Um, how to have peace in a troubled world. And the biggest dilemma that most people have is dealing with the future and the unknown nature of it. Uh, that's what freaks people out. That's why they have anxiety and stress, and that's why they get troubled and worry. It's always about tomorrow. It's never about yesterday. Unless, of course, it's something you did yesterday that may have a consequence that is going to affect tomorrow. I mean, that, that always creates a worry. But what we talked about is how God's word is God's solution. Um, We've talked before how you would not know anything about God if God did not choose to reveal it to you. I mean, that's something that has to be understood by everyone. Everyone believes in God, whether they say they do or they don't. They don't have no explanation. They're really anti-religion, which is good, but uh, everyone believes in God because it's built in them by the Creator for them to believe in Him. That's in Romans 1. And so what happens is with them believing in God but not believing in God's word they have no solution or no place to go to find out how to deal with the events of life so God makes a revelation to you that way you can know God and that's his design his design was to give us his word this isn't an accident this isn't a bunch of guys who heard something about God or a guy had a meeting Moses, uh, you know, confronted the burning bush, went up on a mountain, uh, and God revealed stuff to him. God specifically said, I want you to write this down because these words are my words, and I want you to have them from generation to generation to generation so that you can know what it is that I know, that you can have my mind, you can think like me, you can deal with life that you have, uh, especially for the fact that you're living in a fallen creation and you're dealing with an adversary and you're actually at war. Now these are all things that come from the scripture, and today's not going to be a lesson about the validity of the scripture. However, we're going to have to have some premises once again to deal with it, and one of them is that God's word is God's word. It is his revelation of himself, but what we want to talk about today is not just that God chose to reveal himself, and God's word is simply about his revelation of himself, what I want to talk about today is what God wants, what God designed His Word to do in you. His Word is, is, yes, a revelation of Him, but it's also there to perform a function that God has a purpose in you in why He wrote it and what it will do and produce for you and in you. So let's start by going to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. You know, in, in the premise of understanding who you are, you know, sometimes it's good to remind people. In most discussions I have, the reminder is always there uh, about the fact that they are a living soul. You know, in, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And when God created man, he took the dirt of the ground, he formed it, and he breathed into man. And I love that. He called the dirt man. He breathed into man the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And we have enough verses to confirm to us our understanding that when the body dies, the soul departs. Uh, and there's enough verses to confirm that. You know, when Paul was getting ready to go in, in uh, 2 Timothy, he says uh, that he's, uh, his time of departure is at hand. 
And so uh, it's important to understand the fact that there's more to you than the body that you see. And I think everybody inertly knows that, you know, because what is it that makes you you? It's not your physical appearance. Anyway, let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 says, For this cause, and here's Paul writing to the Thessalonian believers. And, 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 and this is a letter. Paul wrote 13 letters. Um, these are correspondence from him, and, and the argument that some say, well, it was a writing of a man. But this verse is very clear, and it's important. He says, for this cause also, thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which if effectually worketh also in you that believe. There's two primary points that Paul makes when he writes that, is number one, that the book in your hand is the word of God. You know, we say that, and I don't know whether people get that. I mean, think about it. You have God's written word in your hand written by God. Not by men. Men were used to write it, but these are God's words, and you've got to love it. Paul says right here, he says that you received it not as the word of men, but as it is what? In truth, the word of God. So there's one point, but the other one, which is the point of primarily what we're focusing on today, because we're really not going to focus on, on, on how the word of God is the word of God, but with it being that case, and with you in the room and probably most people who are listening, if you're listening to something about the Bible, you have some idea that the Bible has some significance in human life, and it is God's Word. But the second point that he makes is that it effectually works in you if you believe it. God's designed this Word to work in you. He's designed it to do something. It is the living Word of the living God and living in you, that's the premise of where we are. So God's revelation is not just to know him, but to work in you. And to work in you, the word that's interesting is effectually. God has particular things that he has designed his word to produce in you. Look back at the beginning of the Thessalonian letter in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And look, and look at this. I'm going to start in verse 2. Uh, he says, we give thanks to God always. I'm in 1 Thessalonians 1. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren beloved, your election of God, for our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were and samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God word is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. Now, here's Paul writing a letter to the Thessalonians, and if you'll notice in what I just read, there's not one word of reproof in it. It all appears to be a commendation. It, it, it's, it's complimentary. It's, it's how these Thessalonian believers are conducting themselves, and Paul is commending them for it. Uh, in fact, uh, it, you know, in, in verse 7, look what he says. He says he, he refers to them as an ensample. These are a showcase in this letter that he's writing. This, is, this uh, I guess, has been referred to by some as the, the, um, the proper functioning group. The, this is the, uh, the model fellowship of the way these Thessalonian believers function because they believed it. They believed in God's word, and, and it was having a positive effect in them. Uh, in verse 8, look what he goes on to say in verse 8. He says that the way you're doing what you're doing, 
uh, we don't need to say anything. Look at it. He says, For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God were to spread abroad, so that, abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. He, he's, he's looking at what they're doing as a group of believers, and he says, what you do and how you're doing what you do, I don't even need to say anything. You're doing good. You're doing it right. Now, that doesn't mean they're religiously performing right. And see, here's something to understand. The fact that this Thessalonian group is functioning the way it is functioning, this is not happening by nature. This isn't a group that simply had better schools or had a better economic environment, okay? Uh, the way they got the way that they are is 1 Thessalonians 2.13. Once again, the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So what's producing this functioning fellowship that Paul is not reproving but commending and using as an example to other believers and making reference to the fact that he doesn't need to say anything or add anything to the ministry work that they're doing, it's because of what he says in 2.13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing because when ye, he's talking to the believers in this group, Receive the word of God which you heard of us. You received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Now here's an interesting thing to understand. The word effectual. You know, it's almost like a small English lesson here, okay? The word effectual and the word effective, okay? The question is whether or not these words are interchangeable and, and what does effectual really mean? Effectual actually is a much more intense form of the word effective. Okay, Effective is successful in accomplishing a designated purpose. You have many things that you do and you perform them effectively. Somebody might give you a method by which you can learn Italian and it's effective in accomplishing the goal. But effectual is the same thing. It's successful in accomplishing a designated purpose, but in addition to being successful in accomplishing a designated purpose, it's final, it's conclusive, it cannot be improved upon, and is not to be substituted for. Now these are important things to understand as we look at the Word of God that effectual effectually worketh in you versus the word of God being effective. Effectually is that it, it is successful in accomplishing God's designated purpose, but it is final, it is conclusive. It's the only way for you to get established. It cannot be improved upon, and there is no substitute for it. Now think about it. In what you see that goes on in the world of and you know what? It's not just Christianity. It's really religion. There are effective ways to produce fruit. Going back to 1 Thessalonians 1, when we looked at, he commends them in verse 3. He says, Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our, and, and our Father. There are effective ways to produce those fruit, a work of faith. Um, I was involved in a ministry once, and they had uh, evangelism explosion. Okay, this was a work, this was a designed program, and it was effective in causing believers to perform a function to go out and do something that put the Bible in front of people, and people got saved. But it didn't open the door for the effectual working of God's Word in it, because the emphasis wasn't believing the words on the page in the book and trusting that. It was performing. That's what religion is. That's what it does. Religion is effective in a work of faith. It's effective in a labor of love. People will be very uh, 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 religious and diligent about performing a function because religious systems are effective. But we're not talking about religious systems. We're talking about God's Word and the design purpose of His Word to accomplish His purpose in you. Not to make you perform, not to make you look good, but to accomplish what He wants. Uh, so when you look at the effective ways to produce things, you, religion is the obvious, but psychology is another one. Okay? Uh, I mean, uh, 
Counseling. You can go to counseling. Well, here, I got some things in here. Let me write this down. I got Paul's references uh, that produced by believing the word of God, which is effectual, final, no substitutes. I said that. Here, you can demonstrate attributes and characteristics through substitutes, mostly provided by an imposition of law. Going back to effectual, remember when I said effectual means it's not to be substituted for, it's final and it's conclusive. Effective does not have that attribute. So the point is you can demonstrate attributes and characteristics through substitutes, mostly provided by an imposition of law, by religion, by self-motivation, and by guilt. You can effectively produce certain attributes. They're effective, but they're not effectual. You can deal with drugs and getting people out of their addictions through programs that are effective but not effectual. They're not complete. You can go to counseling for marriage uh, and, and for any other relationship deficiency that you have, and those functions are effective. People will recommend you go to marriage counseling. You know, this is a good thing, you know. I mean, and, and I don't want to say it's not a good thing, but it's not God accomplishing what he wants to do, and it's not the solution that is effectual and final and gets it all done. None of these are effectual, None of these are needing no substitute because there's, there's, there's more that has to be done. If you go to marriage counseling once, you're going to go again. If, if you've got drug problems and you go and they have an effective program that works, you're going to do it again. You go out and do evangelism explosion and acts religion, you're going to do it again. If you go to a church that wants to water baptize, you get in there, find out nothing happened, you might think you want to go do it again. I mean, I've heard jokes about guys going down the altar, you know. They have these altar calls and guys are coming and rededicating and rededicating and rededicating and somebody stands up and says, don't even bother with him. He leaks, you know. <laughs> Whatever you're putting in him is fallen out. Effectual is what God's word is designed to be. Look at Matthew chapter 4. In Matthew chapter 4, this is, um, this is the first temptation right in the beginning of chapter 4 where Satan is tempting the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll start in verse 1. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The Lord's understanding of what the Father had designed the written word to be. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, knowing what the word is designed to be, he says man is not to live by bread alone. Now you know if you don't have bread, your body will die. He says man is not to live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Paul's appreciation of the Thessalonians related to their godly behavior. Another word for godly behavior is godliness. But the Thessalonians themselves also appreciate it because it was godliness produced by the effectual working of God's word in their lives because they believed it. God created man to be godly. That was God's design. Originally, go back to Genesis 1. In Genesis chapter 1, and let's see, verse 26. In Genesis 1, 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the, air, the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Look at verse 26. I, I, this is interesting. He says, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. He said, God 
likeness. That's where the word godliness comes from. Man was created not to be a creator. He's a created being, but he was created to be godly. He was created to be like God in the capacities that man has to love and to appreciate and to function. God designed man to function that way. Now we know what happened. But he was designed in, in, God created him in God's image, in God's likeness. This is godliness. And there's actually three, three attributes or elements of godliness if you want to think about what is godliness. One would be thinking like God does. Two would be doing things God's way. And three would be laboring with God in what God is doing. Godliness, to live a godly life. Paul was commending the Thessalonians for living a godly, functional life as believers because they believed the Word of God. First and foremost in godliness, was what the Word of God is designed to do and it effectually works within you is for you to think like God. Thinking like God does produces a functional life. Matthew 4, we just looked at, said that every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of of God is how man should live. And it's also important to understand that godliness is not exclusive to the dispensation of grace. Let's go to John chapter 6 for a minute. God's design for the nation of Israel was for them to be able to function in a godly fashion based on his word that he gave them. All right, John chapter 6, verse 63. This is a good verse. Verse 63, the Lord Jesus Christ, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The word of God is life. His words are life. The Lord Jesus Christ says, my words are life. And it produces a functional life. Remember, Jesus in his earthly ministry is dealing with the religious system. Just like all others. That creates substitutes for what God designed his word to do. To produce in the life of a believer. That's what religious systems do. That's what man does. Is he creates substitutes for what God's word is designed to do. Think about it. God created man, created him to be godly, provided everything he needed to be able to function and live a godly life, and what man does is he creates substitutes. He creates methodologies to function exclusive of God's Word. God's Word is basically set on the side and not put at the centerpiece of what functionality and functioning is. Let's go to the book of Job. Here's a good illustration. Now Job... He had a tough time, didn't he? The book of Job is a phenomenal story relating to his life experiencing and, and what it was that he was trying to endure. And interestingly enough, in the book of Job, Job has three friends. If you've never read the book of Job, you should do it. But he's got three friends, and these friends are very sincerely trying to help him. They're, they're trying to help him get through the torment that he's going through. And they continue to try to help him. And they continue to give him advice. They continue to tell him what it is that they think he should do and how he should deal with his situation. And the thing that frustrated them more than anything was that Job's stand was simply on God's words. They were trying to provide him effective substitutes to his situation. Job said, no, 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 no. I know that my Redeemer liveth. He says, I know what I'm standing on. And, and look what he says in Job 23, verse 12. Now this is real interesting. See how you feel about this verse. Job says, neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Can you say that? 
I mean, the book that you're holding in your hand, you ought to esteem it more than your necessary food. If your house was burning down and you had opportunity to go in and grab one thing, would it be your Bible? I mean, it should be. I mean, outside of the fact that you can go buy one today in a store. But esteem is to place value. And Job, in his torment, with his friends advising all of the effective methods by which he should be able to deal with his situation or get out of it, Job holds to God's word and he says that he esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Remember back in Matthew 4. Jesus said, man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Go to Hebrews 4. You see, when you deal with people, and, and, and I do, and I'm sure all of you do in some respect, it's so frustrating. It, it would be so wonderful if you could have dialogue when people are dealing with tribulation in life to say, what saith the Scripture? I mean, can you imagine if man functioned under the belief system that God revealed himself in words on a page in a book and we have a source and, you know, we got a situation to deal with and, and, and I consult with clients and they come in and I pull out statutes and I pull out references and codes and, and because of what we have to deal with. But dealing with life functions, wouldn't it be better if we just kind of had a... What say at the Scripture? I mean, really, the question is, and here's what happens, is most people do not believe the Scripture provides a solution for every situation. It's good for I'm going to die. It's good for Sunday fellowship. It's good for a framework of how to raise kids. But you can do that in a religious system. Most of us had. Most of us have grabbed a religious system. I mean, when I first started going to church, my daughter had said something kind of weird. It scared me, and I said, we should go to church, and I was raised Catholic, and I said, we've got to go to the Catholic church because I'm not going to hell. You know, I mean, the religious system had indoctrinated me and trained me, and then when I deviated from that, I got scared, and then I started to say, well, what church do you go to? And then the Bible became the issue, and then I, that was it. It's the Bible. It's God's Word. And then I got into a religious system that told me what they wanted to tell me about God's Word, and I just conformed to that system. And you know what? I did evangelism explosion. I went through the navigator's program of training. And, and the reality is I was always looking for how to figure out how to please God with never understanding that I really can. But him working through me can please him because that's what he designed his word to do is to work in me to accomplish his purpose. He's got a purpose. I mean, after you trusted Christ for your salvation, what purpose do you have left on the planet? I know I got heaven. I know to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And you go into 2 Corinthians 5 and he says we know it. And he says not only are we, uh, uh, are, do we know that to be absent is to be present, but we're more willing to go. I mean our desire would be rather to do that. And so what happens is the Bible becomes this little solution thing that has to do with the churchy thing rather than something that God designed to work in you, to function in you, to produce fruit in you that's his desired fruit. So in Hebrews 4.12, I mean, this is a great verse. You know, I mean, most of you probably know it, but Hebrews 4.12 is probably one of the shortest verses that describes, in the fewest words, the effectual working of God's Word in the inner man. He says in Hebrews 4.12, he says, For the Word of God is quick and powerful. Quick means alive, and we can go to verses that will, will, will show us about how he quickened us and, and how that means life. So for the word of God is life and powerful, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. I mean, very clearly it says this book cuts through anything that you have as of some false pretense to protect you from whatever you want to protect you from. Whatever your baggage is that you use it as a defense mechanism to, to justify your behavior and your character, this book cuts right through it and it reads you. It unveils you. If you're daring enough to go in here and look at this, you better be prepared for a mirror that's going to shine on you the things about you that you wish you really don't want to deal with. You know, I mean, I don't really like things that I've done in life. I don't like the way I think at times. When I look at this book, I'm so thankful I have a Savior, but this book cuts right through it. You know, I mean, I heard Jason preaching. He says, 
you know, are you mad at me because I tell you the truth? You know, I mean, am I your enemy? I don't go quote the verse. And he can't talk, so he can't either because he's got um, laryngitis today. So God's word, it was designed by God not just to disclose himself to say, I'm him and I created it, but he designed it to effectually work in you. It's the living word of the living God living in you, living in you. I mean, there's so many places to go with this, and I've and I, I, I kind of cut it short because I don't want to go through everything. So let's go to Philippians 2. Because here's, here's where you have to go with this. Okay, God's Word was designed for a purpose, and okay, God's Word is, is designed to function in me and to produce in me. But how? H how do I do it? How does it work? You know what? I'm dealing with a problem uh, with a family member, and I got an emotional situation, and somebody commits suicide, or, or somebody robbed a bank and got caught and is in jail, and, and you know, I'm, 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 I'm ailing, I'm sick, I can't pay the mortgage, I'm dealing with life. And life is just happening. Circumstances are happening. And, and so, yeah, it's great to know God's Word is going to effectually work in me, but what does that mean relative to my life? How does it become something as a reference tool to use to get through the trials and tribulations? In Philippians chapter 2, and I'm looking at verse 12. And here's Paul writing to the Philippians, and he says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you. God works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God's word in you, working in you, if you take it in. The emphasis is you. At the end of the day, no matter what we understand about God's word, you still have this great authoritative position called I call, cause, call that I will look or I won't look. I'll open or I won't. I'll listen or I won't. I'll learn or I won't. You're totally in charge of dysfunctioning your life. <laughs> That's your privilege. And if you want to go to all of the substitutes in the world on how to try and function... You know, motivational seminars, uh, how to make friends and influence people, you know, think and grow rich. I mean, the things that we look at trying to figure out how to make our life function, and all they are are substitutes for what God's Word can accomplish in you if you'll simply trust it and believe it. you got to get in. So, but look what he says in verse 13. It is God which worketh in you both to will and to do. So it's by you letting God's word in you, God working in you causes you to be willing to go further with God. And then he also equips you with how to do it. You're not alone. Look at Ephesians chapter 3. Now this is interesting. In Ephesians chapter 3, and I want to start with verse 13, I think. Now, look, now you, you got to understand something. When Paul's writing to the, the Ephesian believers, okay, think about where these guys are. In all honesty, they're, 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 they're quaking in their boots, okay? Their apostle, who's God's emissary on the planet, who's writing the words of God on a page for them to trust, he's in jail and he's under the sentence of death. Now, we're following this guy and we're a little troubled because what does following him really bring? I don't know that I want to go to jail and be under the sentence of death. In Ephesians 3 verse 13, this is a prayer of Paul's, he says, Wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. He's saying, don't worry about me. Don't be troubled about my sick of circumstances. Don't, don't faint. Don't slow down. Don't waver. 
stay focused. He says, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. And he goes through a list here. He goes that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit. Where? In the inner man. That Christ may dwell where? In your heart by faith. Yet that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now look at verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that what? Worketh in us. Now from Romans 1 all the way through the book of Ephesians, you know what that power is. It's God's word. It's the gospel of Christ that he died on the cross, paid for your sins, and trusting in him you have the free gift of eternal light. You're secure. You can't be taken down. Yeah, you're going to live with the tribulations of life, so deal with it. That's what it is. What works in us is God's word. And look what he says at the beginning of the verse. It's interesting. Unto him that is able to do what? Exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. He's beyond what you can think. Exceeding abundantly above. It is the word of God that endures. It's the word of God that stabilizes. It's the word of God that gives courage and capacity to go on. There is not... A single circumstance in your life that God's word cannot effectually work within you and enable you to cope with it. Not one. And there's not a single circumstance that will occur in your life that you will have to turn to a substitute for the word of God. But you will be tempted to time and time again. What's my solution? How do I deal with this? Who knows something? What do I do? How do I do it? Listen, we just had a funeral a little while ago. Well, I think it was one of the last things I did. I was out of town for a little while. And, uh, and you watch people trying to cope, and they don't know how to cope. And, we, and we, we ended up having a service in the middle of a religious system that, you know, likes to hang around in the Corinthian letters where there's loads of reproof. I mean, very clearly, Paul says to them, you know, you're rich, we're not. You know, you're powerful, we're weak. You know, everything that you are, we're the off-scouring of the earth. We're the dirt, you know. You're not being a Christian supposed to be glorified by the world. The world isn't going to make you special because you're a Christian. The reality is if you're going to preach God's word, the best you can hope is to be persecuted and to endure suffering and trouble. Because listen, guys, we're the enemy. We really are. When Paul says that we're ambassadors for Christ in a foreign land is what we are. We're in a world that's not controlled by God. The prince of the power of the air is ruling it, and we're invading his territory. We're at war. Paul talks about war. He talks about being soldiers of Christ. He talks about that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Okay, we got to recognize where we are and what we're doing and that if you're going to believe this book, there is going to be persecution that comes. But you got to understand that when you get into this book and you let it work in you, you find out that you're totally secure. That the world can't do anything to you. It can take worldly possessions from you, which you don't need anyway. I mean, I've had opportunity over the last couple of weeks to talk to quite a few individuals that are very religious. They're involved in religious systems, and their religious systems are really what the important thing is. Uh, you know, it's so hard. You know, when you talk to somebody who's in one of those systems, and you say, well, let me ask you this. Is, is, is the root foundation of whatever it is that you guys do the Bible? Oh, yeah. Well, do you read it? Do you understand it? <laughs> you know? I mean, they don't. I mean, the Bible has become to most religious systems a book of one-liners. You know, what, what's God saying to me today? You know, all those little daily bread things and things that they put out. Because people want God in their life, but it's no more, it, it's no different to them than astrology and a horoscope. It really isn't. We don't believe in that horoscope demonic stuff over there, but I'm going to go over here and flip through not understanding a thing, and I'm going to let Satan have his way with me any way he wants, with God's word, you know? And so... 
what ends up happening, and, 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 and I guess the beauty of what we have, when we talk to people, and people on the internet have heard rightly dividing the word of truth, and you know you can be confused about it all you want to unless you're going to read Ephesians 3 and 2 and you know get in and understand that there's something distinctively different that God is doing today in what he's revealed there is no difference on justification unto eternal life it's by faith and always has been but people don't seem to have a respect for the value when Job said I esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. He placed a value above what he needed to sustain life. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, my words are life. He, the Lord Jesus Christ said, not by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. God's design in his word is to comfort you with the knowledge that it is his words the living words of the living God that need to be living in you. And so, where the rest of my notes go, which we don't have time for, or do we? Is to really talk about how that functions in your life. Let's go over to Romans 12. Let's just do some more. I tried to figure a good cutoff point, and I'm not there yet, I guess. In Romans chapter 12, the Apostle Paul in verse 1. Now, now before I read this, okay, 2 Corinthians 5 says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Something new has happened. You know, we look at if any man, the gospel which you trusted after you heard it and you believed it, you were sealed to the, rede the day of redemption. When we look at that, uh, we all have been baptized into one body. By one spirit are we all baptized into one body. You trusted Christ. You got placed in Christ. You're in something new that you don't know. When you trust Christ and get saved, God doesn't come with a hacksaw, cut the top of your head off, and pour it all in. You've got to find out who you are in Christ when you find out that you're now associated with God. Know ye not that your body is the temple of God and His Spirit dwells in you? The close relationship that you have with God being in Christ is one that you don't have any knowledge about, so you have to go to God's Word to get it. So in Romans 12, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. But how do you do that? He goes on to say, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Your mind needs to be renewed. You need to learn something you didn't know before. And God's word is where you go to learn it. I mean... I bought bicycles for my kids at Christmas time, and I put them together, and after they came together wrong, somebody said, well, why don't you go read the instructions? And so then I'd go back, and I'd redo it and build it correctly. God's designed his word not just as a revelation of himself, but he designed his word to effectually work in you that believe it. Now, this doesn't mean join the cult of will believe it, you know? This means read it. God will help you believe it because you can't read it and challenge it and tear it up without growing in confidence. What does Romans 10, 17 say? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How do we function as members of the church, the body of Christ, with each other? Do you have any members of the church, the body of Christ, that you just kind of don't like? Well, from what I understand, we're to love one another and we're to esteem one another greater than ourselves. And we start first with members of the body. I mean, I got a kick out of it. You know where, where Paul, where is it? I'm not, I'm not even going to, where Paul's going in and he kind of makes an analogy of, of the, the members of the body of Christ with the members of the body. He uses the human body as an analogy. You know, if, if the whole body was an eye, where would there be hearing? Okay, kind of help you understand that there's different members with different functions in the body and they're all important and they all work together. If you think about it, the reason he uses the human body as an illustration is your body functions in favor of all the other parts. Think about it. If you hurt your foot, your hand wouldn't go, 
and laugh. Okay? Your hand might go ahead and function by getting down and wrapping a cloth around it. Okay? The elements of the body work together. They all do. And so it, it, it's almost funny the way that he uses the parallel, but to understand it, it's to say that the foot needs the hand, the head needs the ear and the eye and the mouth. All of them have to work together to function successfully. And Paul says we're to love one another. We're members one of another. So we should be loving and forgiving to each other because that's what God says. And when you read it and you believe it, it effectually works in you and you accomplish it. This is application of God's Word affectionately working in you. How to do it. Oh, you know what? That person over there, I can't stand him, and I don't want to lead him to Christ because I don't want to have to treat him like a member of one of another. <laughs> you know? And the ones that are already in that I don't like, well, can't cut them off. You know what this is? This is called self. You know, you've got psychological systems out there that are built on building self-esteem. Are you familiar with that? I mean, have you heard that, you know, we need to build their self-esteem? Children, we need to raise their self-esteem. Go to counseling. Problem is you don't love yourself enough. You know what? You come into this world with more self-esteem than you need. In fact, you need to get rid of it in order to love one another because you're born with a sin nature, and the only thing you really care about is yourself. That's natural. We don't need to build more self. We need to get rid of self so that we can humble ourselves and love one another. And that happens, that's a result of the effectual working of his word. Because he comes in and confronts me and says, wow, you know what, you don't deserve to go to heaven. In fact, you deserve to go to hell. But God so loved the world, we look at a verse, Christ came in, died, he paid the debt and penalty of our sin so we could have the gift of eternal life. That's a gift. We don't deserve it. When you understand that you don't deserve it, you get a little less arrogant about being one of the ones that are in the good group. And you see religious systems out there that, that go through the caste system of the haves and the have-nots, they like to have some people are higher up and deserve more accolades and more recognition in their religious system. Jesus Christ became a servant of all. God himself demonstrated how to function and how to live and how to put others first. God's word effectually working in us can help us to accomplish that. Not by a substitute system of will worship and trying to manage our lifestyle, but by yielding to God's word and allowing him to function and live through us. Galatians 2.20. I can't close without that, I suppose. I think I'm about out of time, so... I've always loved this verse. I loved this verse before I understood what this verse meant. You know, I talked to the young guy, the kids and I talked to them about how Christ died on the cross for you and he died on the cross as you. And this is 2,000 years before you. God's perfect solution. God's rescue mission to rescue the souls of men. The fallen creation that he loved and created to be God-like. In our image, in our likeness that fell. Romans 5, 8 worth throwing in there. God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But look at Galatians 2.20. I am crucified. His death is my death. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ liveth in me, his life, not mine. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Listen, we're not talking about being puppets. We're not talking about pretending and faking and making the world think we're something we're not. We're talking about being honest people that recognize that we have a need for a Savior and we have one, and he designed his book to effectually without substitute, final, completely work in us to produce functional life. His desire is to live in and through us. We get to do it with him. You know, the, the term reckon that Paul uses, and I thought about this because I've, I've actually, I've heard myself say something contradictory. And when Paul uses the word reckon, reckon ye yourself dead uh, to sin. Uh, to reckon is to reconcile with something is to acknowledge it to be true. That's what it is. When you, you say, reckon this to be so, reckon it to be true. To reckon that you're dead is to say, I'm dead. To reckon to say that you're dead to sin actually means it's true, I'm dead to sin. 
Now, we'll go along and say, well, you know, we may learn to sin less and sin less and sin less, but we'll never be sinless. God functioning in my life completely, I wouldn't sin. I am dead to sin. The reality is I still do. And what Paul did in his illustration when he, you know, he talks about that which I want to do, I, I don't do, and that what I don't want to do, I do. And I'm, I'm not quoting the verse, but you know what Paul was saying. He said, wretched man that I am in this body because I still sin. But I am dead to sin. And I am alive in Christ. I am crucified with Christ. But yet I'm still alive. But Christ is living in me. Reckon it. Believe it to be true. God will function in your life if you simply allow Him to by believing His Word. That's it. That's the verse. Let's close with that verse. 1 Thessalonians 2.13, it's where we started. How do you want to function in the Christian life? Drop dead. <laughs> Get out of the way. Paul looked at that model group of believers, the Thessalonians. He looked at them and he commended them for their function. He, he talked about how, how they were an example of, 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 of a functioning church. And it was based on the premise of the living word of the living God living in them with 1 Thessalonians 2.13 which says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing because when ye received the word of God... Which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for you allowing us to know your mind. For you putting on paper for us to know and understand how you love us and how you will function in and through us for your good pleasure. That you equip us to deal with it. That there isn't a circumstance that we go through in life that's not common to every other person on the planet. But because of the peace we have with you that we know through your word. Because of our security that we know through your word. Because of our completeness that we know through your word. We can cope with anything. So we thank you for your word, and, and we just hope that anyone who's hearing this can come to an understanding that it's not a religious system, it's not our group versus their group, but it's your word that effectually worketh in those that believe. And we give you praise for it, we give you thanks for it, in Christ's name, amen.